um, sort of short-term quantum computer prototype, the main role of near-term quantum computers is to give us a playground to understand what to do with real quantum computers. Right. Right? Got it. There is no quantum computer in the world right now that does a useful computation that a classical computer cannot do. Got it. Okay? There has been a big result from Google last year when they showed what they call quantum supremacy, which means the execution of an algorithm that would be really intractable by even the most powerful classical supercomputer. And that's a genuine result. It's a real breakthrough. But that calculation that was executed is not a useful calculation as such. Right? It was just to prove, it was just to prove quantum supremacy exists. Exist. But the important point, and, and the Google people are very explicit and honest about it, is that having a machine like that in your hands mm -hmm. is what you need for quantum software developers to learn what you can do with a quantum computer once you have one. It's just really hard to write code for a computer that you don't have. Exactly. <laughs> so it's actually, I, find it, I find it remarkable and almost a miracle of human <laughs> intellect that we do have quantum algorithms that people yes. have cooked up in their yeah, head yeah, without yeah. actually having a the computer to run it on. Yeah, right? yeah. Well, that's a, well, there's a whole history of that in, in, in computing. People writing simulating. Yeah. So can we quickly talk about, because that brings up D-Wave, for yeah. example. A lot of people say that's not really a quantum computer. It's a quantum annealer, but again, for D-Wave, I will say in their defense, a lot of quantum algorithms have been invented and developed just by the sheer existence oh, of the D-Wave machine. Right. Now, the results that those calculations yield are not results that you couldn't have achieved using a classical computer. So not quantum supremacy. But yeah. just by having the machine there, a lot of clever people have had the opportunity to develop quantum algorithms that on a more powerful machine will then actually be useful. Got it. Okay, so it's more of a development platform, really, than any producing any useful... At this point, it is, yeah. Okay. I mean, they all are. Really. Uh, right, yes, of they course. They all are. Yeah, yeah, we don't really have a, yeah. a quantum computer that's doing useful work, really. No. 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 Okay. No. So, we've got quantum, quantum supremacy has been proven. Mm -hmm. What about classical supremacy? Are there, for want of a better term, is that a term? I don't know. Where... There are things that can that can be done on a classical computer that will never be able to be performed on a quantum computer. Uh, well, okay. So first of all, there are theorems that show that any classically computable function can be computed on a quantum computer. It's oh, just that okay. you would you would never do it. It's just comp it's, it's like taking a Boeing seven four seven to go and buy a loaf of bread at the, at the shop up there. You know, okay. you could, but would you? You know, yeah. Right. Um, there's one really interesting thing that's happening um, in the last couple of years. They call it dequantizing de quantum algorithms. So there's some, there's some, I'll get to that. Okay. So there's some clever people who invent quantum algorithms that are at face value superior to the known classical algorithms that are known to exist. And then the classical computer scientists dequantize it, meaning they find oh. the better classical algorithm and they often take inspiration from the quantum ah, one. So the ideas and the insights of the quantum software developers inspire classical software developers to come up with a new algorithm that runs on a classical computer that they probably otherwise would not have come up with. And inspire them to think outside yeah. their box. Yeah. So ah, yeah. that's interesting. Okay. So you, I think you covered it there. There is no such thing as classical supremacy where there, you said a quantum computer could in theory do anything a classical computer yeah, could do. Yeah, but it would normally do it much slower. Right. So, okay. for example, one thing to keep in mind is um, clock speed. Okay, That's something we haven't talked about. You know, any classical microchip runs at a gigahertz or two or three yeah. nowadays. You buy them for a few dollars from the shop. Um, quantum computers have a clock speed that depends on the physical details of the hardware that is being chosen, but the clock speed rarely exceeds a few tens of megahertz. Okay. Okay. So, so even the fastest ones, yeah. yeah. 
Okay. Even the fastest ones, fastest ones rarely go past some tens, maybe a hundred megahertz. Can you see so, a future where that scales higher, or are there sort of fundamental? Uh, at the moment, anyway, you can't mm, say in a hundred years we're we're not going to do it. You but. can't say, but at the moment there there aren't. The thing is that if you try and go faster, the errors goes up. The okay. errors go up. Is the speed affected by, is the computational clock speed affected mm -hmm. by the, you talked about the logical elements. So mm -hmm. you could have logical, uh, sorry, a logical qubit could be made up of, you know, a hundred mm -hmm. physical qubits. Yeah. Does that affect the speed? Um, well, so the logical, the way in which you build the logical qubit will eat up hardware resources. But the clock speed is the, the clock speed it, of, it, the, of, the, of the basic right. okay. elements. To answer your question, um, in a sense, if you think of a fundamental you know, speed limit, it, it usually boils down to the actual energy mm -hmm. difference of the logical quantum state of the qubits. So pretty much most of the useful qubits that we know of with some exceptions but most of them work in the gigahertz range mm -hmm. of precession frequency right yes. and then when you think about how you operate them you want an interaction between them that is a small fraction of their energy difference otherwise they're not qubits anymore they become like a blob <laughs> <laughs> So if you run this thing as 10 gigahertz, you want it to couple to the other system by 100 megahertz, maybe a gigahertz maximum. And that is fundamentally the speed at which you do things. Okay, so yeah. there appears to be yeah. a fund for all in, per, intents and purposes, yeah. there's a limit there. Yeah, there are other systems like there are atomic clocks, there are optical clocks, they work at, of course, you know, tens of terahertz. Yeah, terahertz, yeah. But then making them interact with each other is not easy. So, it's, oh. yeah, right? It's, but, but, you know, this is part of the beauty of quantum technologies. We have some, you know, leading platforms that are well developed, they're having great results, but we haven't, you know, we don't have the equivalent of the CMOS transistor in quantum computing yet, right? right? There is still a lot of platforms, each one with its pros and cons. And Is that kind of the aim that you want? You want this element that you can, because the way they produce uh, CPUs these days is they have yeah. these elements, they can just yeah. drop them in and they just work. Is yeah, that the... but then again, I'll, I'll, I'll respond to this by saying that this is the way it was until maybe 10 years ago. Now you're getting a lot more of those uh, application-specific hardware, right? So the classic CPU that yep. you always use for everything is not really the way it's done anymore. I mean, it's still there, but if you really want to push, now push you it. get the GPU for this, you get some mathematical... ASICs so, everywhere. They're very expensive, yep. but they can... They're more energy efficient, they're yeah. faster, they're, they can do it. So we've better. kind of going out yeah, yeah. into the specialization right. there as well. And for quantum computing, for all you know, it might always stay that way. There might be certain types of hardware that are most suited for certain kind of simulation. For example, the things that D-Wave makes, mm -hmm. the quantum annealers, um, they might remain the preferred platform for certain like optimization problem, that's what they naturally do. Right. Whereas for some other kinds of calculations, you just need a different system, which might be built in a completely different hardware. Will, there, will quantum computers be like general purpose computers or will they be like application specific? As you said, are they, it's are hard they to better tell. to... It's hard to tell. So um, people like myself and many colleagues around the world work on what we call a universal digital quantum computer. So we, we, our goal is to make the equivalent of your PC. You know, you just you can means, program it, program do it and it you does what you want. Um, this, if it ever happens, will be a very long term goal. I think for the next couple of decades, we right. will have 
ASICs, right? Okay, Raspi right. Sessions the specific specific. Thing. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So there's other teams, they think, oh, no, look, ASIC is yeah. where we're going to focus yeah. on the yeah. ASIC type yeah. stuff. Yeah. Right. So, so you've got to essentially program, you've got to build that, sil- if, if it's out of silicon, you have to build that silicon for that specific task to solve prime number crunching to solve uh, at some specific task you're doing, you model in how molecules work and things like that. Put it this way, the reason I'm working on silicon is because it seems to me and to a lot of people, the one of the most plausible platforms for universal quantum computers. The okay. ones that will get way down the track, the ones that will be really general purpose and really have a broad, deep impact. If I wanted to make a medium term application specific device, I may or may not have chosen silicon. Okay, right. right. Silicon has, well, okay. Silicon from a physics point of view has some interesting advantages such as the time it can hold the quantum information in it because of this purification. Yes, How, is right. How long are we talking about? Uh, for the electron, we're coming near one second. For the nucleus, we have shown 35 seconds a couple of years ago in my okay. group. Okay, yeah. I, I expected much longer. No, 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 okay, no. so it's got to do the computation in that time yeah. on that data. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we run, okay, so the electron runs at 100 nanosecond, a few hundred nanosecond clock. And it's got a one second lifetime. Eh? So, right. yeah. Okay. Right. So the you've nucleus got to, runs a bit slower. But. So, you've got to program it with the information yeah. and then process that information mm-hmm. within, essentially. Yeah. No, you, don't, no, no. you don't need to get to the end of the computation in one second. Oh, okay. No, because right. as you run it, you can correct for little errors, right? Oh, so, you've got this clock at, let's say, a micro, let's say, a megahertz clock. And so, in a second, you can do a thousand clock cycles. Yeah. And among those clock cycles, there will be cycles that do error detection and correction. So as long as you're processing... So yeah, as long as you're doing it, it just keeps Ah, your life. Ah, okay. So is is it the accumulation of errors that would cause... If you do nothing with it, if you're programming Mm -hmm. in the information... If you do nothing, then you've got one second to go. It just totally... But if you run the quantum error correction, then it keeps it up. It's like props. So why does it... (laughs) essentially why does the information in there essentially why does it dissipate like, um is well that... so that um it's actually not it's not exactly a dissipation, dissipation. it's it's I was uh, looking for a better term yeah dissipation <laughs> is the word you use when it's dissipated in energy loss Energy loss. okay right. and actually our qubits have excellent energy loss actually non-loss a non-loss properties. okay right so the electron actually is about five, ten seconds, Mm -hmm. the nucleus is literally the age of the universe. So the energy loss of the nucleus is unmeasurable. If you ask me how much it is, I don't know. I never had the patience to measure it. Like you can't. But what it's called, it's dephasing. It's like clock desynchronization. Okay, so imagine these qubits as little clocks. And the quantum information is kept in something that you may think resembles the the relation between clocks. You know, like when you go to those uh, old, well, they don't do it anymore, you know, those airports or those offices in the multinationals where well, yeah, they have all the clocks with all the time in all their main offices around the world, you know? Imagine those clocks don't all run at the same speed. They're all drifting. At some point, you yeah. just don't know what time it is anywhere, right? Eh? And you can't correct it. At, at some point, you lose the ability yeah. to correct it. Yeah. Okay. But if you correct and check often enough, there are some theorems that show you that if you do it well enough and often enough and the, and the desynchronization is slow enough, yep. you can actually keep track of it. Fascinating. Okay, I assume that they stayed there for... That's, no, that's no, no. interesting. They don't need wow. to. That's okay. the beauty. They don't need to. This is for <laughs> our engineer friends. You know, yep. there is... It, it is a genuine engineering problem. There are tolerances, like right. in any of engineering course. design. Yeah. The, the tolerance yep. is not zero, it's yes. finite. That's on regular silicon CPUs as well. The tolerance is there, mm-hmm. you know. Yep. You get cosmic ray impacts, you get other, you get electron migration, and you yeah. get all sorts of yeah, other yeah. issues involved. Yeah. Okay. And you design the whole, both the hardware and the software that runs it in a way that is capable of 
detecting and correcting these problems. Huh?